this Thursday, the 20th, is our ladies meeting. It is going to be at 7 o'clock right here. We have guest speaker Meredith Elliott coming. We're super, super excited for um, some wisdom that she can impart, for some uplifting message that she can impart. I encourage you to come to that. I encourage you to invite people to that. I think it's going to be a, a fantastic night. I think it's going to be um, full of, of intimate um, worship with the Lord. She just um, she she has a unique perspective and a unique look, and she's definitely um, studied the Word. And so we're excited to have her here, and we encourage you to come and, and join us for that this Thursday at 7 o'clock right here. We are now in Stockings of Hope ministry um, territory. I know it's not Halloween yet, but it takes a few months of prep time. So if you want to give financially to Stockings of Hope, you can give through PayPal, and that's Living Grace 40383. You can give through our website, and that's livinggrace40383.com. You can give through Venmo, and that's at livinggrace40383. See, there's a thread here. It's easy to figure out how to give. <laughs> And then if you just want to do a check, you can mail it right here um, at 128 East Green Street in Versailles. These are ways you can give financially to Stockings of Hope. Now, if you would prefer to give items to Stocking of Hope, there are items you can give. You can give candy. Um, right now, Kroger's has their Halloween candy out. When Halloween's over, it often goes on sale for like half off. We encourage you to take advantage of those deals. We don't buy the stuff that has like pumpkins, but your regular bags of candy work. You can get it for a really, really good steal, and we always need candy. Um, snack foods, stocking size toys. This can be anything from Play-Doh to any kind of inflatable to those little punch balls. I mean, there's a, just imagine all the smaller toys that kids love, they'll fit in a stocking. We also find that pens, pencils, crayons, stationery, sticker sheets, things like that can fit in a stocking really well. And we put those in stockings as well. So you can give financially or you can give just items. Um, if you want to give items, you can just message the church and we'll make sure somebody's here to meet up with you to get those. Um, and the same vein, <laughs> if you want to donate financially to Stockings of Hope, for every $10 donated, we are giving away a stock, a uh, nativity set. And that's what they look like. That's your wise men and Mary and Joseph, the baby and a shepherd. Um, so if you are interested in a nativity, just a $10 donation to Stockings of Hope and it's yours. So message us, let us know, and we can arrange payment pickup. If you want to just pay cash and come get it, you can do that as well. Um, we're pretty flexible. So these nativities are absolutely adorable, number one absolutely adorable number two they're one of a kind they're hand painted so no one set is identical to the other set which is really really cool number three it supports stockings of hope which helps all kinds of people in your community not just kids but moms you know we've all been moms and wondered how we're going to get for our kids it makes mom and dad rest a little easier knowing there's something there for the kids on christmas there is they come in a drawstring pouch and i don't have it up here to show you but it's really cute <laughs> Uh, um, there's a white and a black one. I don't know which one you'll end up getting, but they're big enough to hold all the little pieces together for you, so you don't have to worry about keeping up with them. So I encourage you to give to Stockings of Hope and get a super, super duper cute nativity for that. And then lastly, it's an election year. And if you're like me, I don't understand why some of these yards have 500 signs because I can't see them all. <laughs> I see the first one and I see the last one, but all the ones in between, I can't see all those signs. <laughs> But it is an election year, and we like to pray in an election year. And so this year, November the 7th, I know it's a few weeks off, but I just want to have your minds engaged about it. Uh, we could call it intercession then whatever year it is. So before it's been intercession 2020 or intercession whatever. So intercession 2020, this year is going to be November the 7th. That's a Monday right here at 6 o'clock. What we do is we gather and we pray. We pray over the ballot. We pray over the local people on the ballot. We pray over, like, if it's a, if it's a presidential race, we pray for that. Um, we pray for people. We we don't come in and say, well, I'm going to vote for so-and-so. We pray for whoever wins. So we pray for both candidates or all six candidates, whoever's up on the ballot. We pray for each of them that whoever, so that whoever wins has the anointing of the Lord, has the blessing of the Lord. And um, we just pray for, for the future four years that they're in office, the future term that they may have in office, and we pray for the citizens that they're serving. Um, we have all in some way probably served in a public service way, and we know there are times that's hard. <laughs> that can be difficult. So we pray just that the people they work with are kind and easy to work with. So um, anybody, again, is welcome to come do that with us. So that is the Monday before Election Day. Elections are the 8th. So Monday the 7th, we'll meet here at 6, and we just pray till we're done. That's why it's not a 6 till. Sometimes we've been done in like 15 minutes. There's been other times we've been here 45. So we just let the Holy Spirit have his way. And we pray, and we believe you pray first, then you go vote. 
So we pray Monday night and then we all get out first thing Tuesday morning and vote. So I encourage you to be a part of Intercession 2022 this year. That will wrap it up for our announcements. The youth can go and continue along their path of things that they are doing. <clears throat> so it's spooky time. <laughs> it's October and it's Halloween. And so I thought maybe for October I can make my messages be spooky. I was about to say, it didn't close. <laughs> um, with the ghost, the door opened back up by itself. <laughs> <laughs> I should make all the lights go dim and light candles and go, it's a dark and oh, rainy God. night. <laughs> it's kind of, it is kind of rainy. I mean, it works. It's quite windy. Yeah. But I thought we'll do um, some Halloween themed type um, messages because I think it's okay to get in on the season. I think it's okay to laugh and have fun. Nobody really thinks there's ghosts out there haunting us. Nobody here really is going to worship the occult or dress like goats. I saw the thing online where people were dressing like goats. And I was like, I get that a goat is like symbolic of Baphomet, which is supposed to be a bad guy, like evil. But I like goats. <laughs> I think they're adorable. <laughs> so the purpose of that is completely lost on me. <laughs> but anyway, so we're going to talk about hiding. And I looked on the internet for something really cute to put up there to represent hiding. And it's really hard to find something because either, either it was completely inappropriate <laughs> or it had all of the like um, like the branding things. Like it'll have Shuttershock across it or whoever so that you can't use it. And I was like, oh, I'm not the only one cashing in on the Halloween season. <laughs> so I thought we talk about hiding because that's what we do when we're scared. When you get freaked out, when you get worried, we tend to scare. We hide. Um, from monsters, you see it on um, little kids. They'll go run in their bed and they put the covers up over their head. We hide um, from uh, real monsters, right? If we know um, there's a, a dangerous place, we, we don't go there. We hide from them. <laughs> we, um, there's a, there used to be a commercial on TV years ago and it was talking about um, a, a doorbell, like Everybody's got a ring doorbell now, but when they were first coming out on the market, it was talking about the doorbell, they could tell who was at the door. And in the commercial, when people came, the whole family would turn all the lights out and the TV off, and they would all hit the floor like there was gunfire. And they'd go, shh, because they didn't know who was at the door and they were hiding from them. And they were saying, you know, if you got this ring doorbell, you could see and you didn't have to do all that stuff. So we hide um, superficially from all kinds of silly stuff. Uh, but we also hide from consequences. We don't like to accept when we're wrong or when we've made a mistake. Um, and especially if it's the kind of mistake that you can't fix. Like if I forgot there was church tonight, but I go ahead and get in the car and get there and I'm 10 minutes late. You're fine. But if you forget there was church and you remember at 10 o'clock, you can't fix that. <laughs> you missed. <laughs> You know, sometimes there's things we do, and that's a light consequence, obviously. There's, there's all kinds of reasons why people miss church, but um, there's, there's often times when we can fix something, and so we don't hide from that, but we hide from the things we can't fix. Um, we forget somebody's birthday, so we just don't contact them for a while because we're afraid they're going to be mad. They're going to be upset because you can't fix that. You can't go back in time and act like you didn't forget. You forgot. <laughs> we hide from, um, from vulnerability. We hide from anything that would expose us, anything that would tell the world what we really think, tell the world um, who we really are, tell the world, um, just kind of expose our private life. Uh, the kids used to say that um, your cell phone can spy on you. Like if you go into settings, you can unset something, but they can hear conversations and that's how your ads are like on Facebook, they're up to you because it can hear. And the kids are like, we can, re we can reset your phone and we can go into your settings and it can all be private again. And I'm like, huh? And I was like, babe, anything I'm doing in private, if people found out, they would be so bored. <laughs> they would see me scrubbing floors and baseboards. They would see me boiling water. They would see me. <laughs> the biggest thing that I would be embarrassed about is how long it takes me to talk myself into wearing appropriate attire for the day. If I don't have to be out first thing in the morning, 
I will put that off and wear house pants and an oversized shirt as long as I possibly can. And if that's till two in the afternoon, I'll do it till two. <laughs> like if I have appointments and stuff, then I'm up and at it. But if there's nothing right there, it's embarrassing how long it takes me to put decent clothes on. But otherwise, we generally, we don't want people seeing who we are in private. We don't want, when I'm angry, when I'm very angry, I am not the Jesus loving Joe that people see in the pulpit. I'm not. I'd like to be, but I'm not. I get a little snarky. I get a little tooty. <laughs> I raise my voice a little bit. I wouldn't be proud for people to see that. I hide that. Nobody gets to see me when I'm angry, except Nathan. And he's used to it. 24 years in, he's like, well, you know, she'll get over it. <laughs> Nobody gets to see that part because it would open me up. Because it, for me, it's not that I don't want people to see me get mad. Everybody gets mad, I know that. But they'll see what makes me mad. And anybody who knows me well, my husband being the one who knows me best, knows that the only thing that makes me super mad and angry is if I get hurt. And that is true physically as well as it is spiritually or emotionally. If I stub my toe, I get really mad. <laughs> like, really mad. If something hurts, I get mad. I don't like it. It makes me mad. Okay, I don't get that. I am the same way if somebody hurts my feelings. If somebody says something ugly, if somebody forgets something, whatever. If, if I'm hurt, I get mad. And so oftentimes, there have been times when Nathan comes home and I'm just mad for apparent, no apparent reason. And he knows instinctively, she's not mad, she's hurt. Somebody said something, somebody did something. And so he instinctively knows it's not calm down, you're having a fit, it's that time of month, whatever. It's, I gotta figure out what happened today. Where did she go? Who did she talk to? So that he, I can minister to the pain. Because if I can get rid of the hurt, I can get rid of the mad. But as long as she's hurt, she's gonna be mad. <laughs> so I don't, want, I don't want people knowing when I'm mad because I don't want you to know what hurts because that's gonna make me vulnerable. Yeah. Right. So I'm gonna hide that part. I'm not gonna let you in on that part. And I shared all of that just to let you know, especially throughout this season, being scared is not a sin. We were taught a lot of the times that being scared is a sin because you're doubting God. You know, because you're, you're not standing in faith, that you don't have fruits of the Spirit, that you're an immature Christian. There's all kinds of negative connotations if you're afraid of anything, regardless of what that thing is. Um, that's not necessarily true. Uh, we see the giants in the faith being told all the time, fear not. Um, from a physical presence of an angel, which apparently is super scary, because every time they show up on the scene, the first thing they say is, don't be afraid. So that tells me that would weird me out. They're super scary. And if they say, don't be afraid, it means they're fully aware that's an emotion we have to deal with. That's an emotion that comes through no participation of our own. We cannot stop ourselves from being afraid. It happens. Whatever the thing is that scares us, whether it's a physical snake or a relationship, we're going to be afraid and we can't stop that from happening. And so therefore, it's not sinful. Sinful is something that's willfully done. It's something you choose to do. I would almost say being scared is could have some points in holiness because for a Christian, it drives us back to Jesus. If I'm afraid of something, I'm going to run to the one that can take care of it. I'm going to run to the one that can protect me. I'm going to run to the one that can shield me. When our kids get, get afraid, when, our, you know, when the boys were tiny and they had bad dreams, where did they go? They ran to mom and daddy. They want to be in mom and daddy's bed, right? You're going to run to God when you're scared. So being scared isn't sinful if it drives you into the arm of Jesus. I mean, that couldn't be anything better than that. But hiding turns out to be our number one go-to thing. Because the very first story we have in Scripture is Adam and Eve, and they hide. In Genesis 3, verses 7 through 9, I think. I have 10 here, but I think I only did 7 through 9. They've just been eating the fruit and figured out they're naked. <laughs> then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. <clears throat> May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. So the first thing Adam and Eve did was hide their bodies, and then they hid from God. Twice, their first thing they did was, I see this, I'm going to hide it so I don't have to see it anymore. I hear him, and I'm going to hide <laughs> That's the first thing they did after they sinned. They hid. Oftentimes, that's the first thing we do. We hide. For a whole host of reasons. Um, if you're like me, I hide out of shame because I know better. 
Most of the time when I mess up, I knew better. I let my flesh get a hold of me. I let temptation win. I, I wasn't as strong as maybe I should have been. Um, and so I don't immediately go to God and be like, I messed up, please come fix this for me. I try to fix it by myself because I don't want, I'm ashamed, I don't want to have to look at God and say, still not where I should be by now. <laughs> still messing the same stuff up like I always have. So you don't go to God over that. Um, there's failure and embarrassment that comes when we fail. Um, there have been times this year even, uh, coming out of COVID and trying to, I've been trying to do things at the church like we've always done them. And coming out of COVID, it's taken a lot because I'm apparently very dense, but <laughs> I'm learning that we can't do things the way we always did them, that it's a different world. And so I put a lot of resources and I put a lot of money and I put a lot of hype into certain fundraisers and they failed miserably. And it cost people money and it cost people time and and, and I hid from that. I didn't want to talk about those fundraisers. I wouldn't talk about them to church members. I wouldn't talk about them to people. I wanted to hide from the fact that I had put up this solution and I had put up this thing that had always worked in the past. And then it failed and cost everybody something because I decided it was the thing to do and it was failure. And, and I wanted to hide from that. I wanted to pretend that did not happen. But there was a lesson to be learned. There was me, in order for me to get the idea of, what worked pre-COVID is not going to work post-COVID. You've got to find a new way. Man, I had to wade through that. I couldn't keep hiding from it. I had to figure out, all right, what parts of this can we tweak? What parts of this can we change? Because fear makes us forget who we are <clears throat> and who he is. I am not supposed to have all the answers. <laughs> yes. I am not supposed to be planning everything we do on my own. And because these things worked so well pre-COVID, that's exactly what I did. Well, I know what we do. We do this, and we do this, and, we do, and I never stopped and said, God, should we do this this year? Never once, because it was always successful before. I forgot God's the head, not me. God's the leader, not me. And my fear made me forget that. My fear of failure, my fear of, of letting people down, my fear of not bouncing back, and all of the big fears that come into everybody's minds when they try something, we forget that it's not up to us. It's not our work. It's his. And that's when fear can become detrimental. <clears throat> now, some of you may be saying, I get what you're saying, Joe, but I don't really hide from nothing. I feel you because I don't either. If there's somebody knocking at my door, I don't go hide under the covers. Um, I know wives who call their husbands and they're like, you have to come home, there's somebody outside. I don't do that. And I'll tell you why. And again, I'm wired weird. I'll tell you why I don't do that because I have to convince myself I'm not afraid. <laughs> I, I have to convince myself I'm not scared. <laughs> so what I do is I arm myself. I don't go hide, I get ready for battle. <clears throat> Nathan proposed to me <coughs> when I was very young. I was 17. I didn't turn 18 until like three or four weeks after he proposed. And then a year later, of course, we got married. So early on in our marriage, we had Caleb, and I was pregnant with Ben, and he got put to second and third shift a lot. So I was home alone, pregnant. We had a little townhouse um, and Caleb. And so in the evenings, I would, and the bedrooms were upstairs. There were two bedrooms and a full bath upstairs. Everything was down. And so we got, I think it was satellite TV at that time, like stuff 100 years ago. And um, I would take all, I would, we would do supper and I would clean up the kitchen and then we would go upstairs and I would give Caleb his bath and I would put Caleb to bed across the hall and then I would go to my room and I just stayed upstairs the rest of the evening. I would watch satellite TV or I would rest or whatever. And then you would hear stuff downstairs because that's where the laundry room was. So if the washer kicked or got unbalanced just enough to make something vibrate or whatever, that during the day you wouldn't think anything about. When you're home alone, eight months pregnant with a little, <laughs> you hear stuff. So I didn't hide. I didn't call somebody to come over and check. You know, I didn't call my brother to come check my house because I hear noises. I went and dug in the closet and got out one of Nathan's big old golf clubs and I went downstairs and I sat it beside the door. And then I went and dug out one of Nathan's baseball bats because he was a softball coach for a little bit for one of the teams at work. And I pulled out one of the baseball bats and I put it by the back door at the kitchen. And then I went upstairs. <laughs> I mean, I strategically put weapons where if somebody came through, it was just for me to grab and swing. I was going to be ready. And then I would go upstairs and I would go fit. I wouldn't hide. I wouldn't pretend it wasn't going on. I was like, all right, you want to come at me? Let's fight. So I would, I would arm myself. That was my plan. 
And then I got a little bit older. And then before that, I worked in Lexington. I worked downtown for sales for a long time. And then the firm split. I ended up going to Lexington. I'm working downtown Lexington. I worked on FinFin, fin, which was a class action lawsuit at the time. And 12-hour days. Very regular 12-hour days. So in the winter, when I got off and was able to go to my car in a parking garage, it was pitch black and I was by myself downtown Lexington. And there was always vagrants or somebody hanging out. None of them ever threatened me at all, but I was scared. <laughs> and, I had to, and I had to prove to myself that I wasn't afraid. So I went to one of these festivals that they had and they had stun guns and I bought myself one. And I decided I wouldn't be afraid because I'd be armed. And so I did that for about a week and then I got home and I was like, what if this thing doesn't even work? So I got to think of that. So oh, no. I got, uh -oh, don't tell me. I got my brother and his best friend at the time, Matt, <laughs> to let me do it to him. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I did. I, I did it. But did it work? I was like, it works. <laughs> Go. And so I did it to them and it worked and I was a happy camper. Uh, and because I was, I'd armed myself. I wasn't going to park two more blocks away where it was well lit out of fear. I was going to park in that parking garage where everybody else was parking and I was going to use my stun gun. It didn't occur to me at that time that in order to use the stun gun, they were going to have to be up on me. That, you know, the, the reach is this far. <laughs> they can take it, knock it out of my hand. They can do whatever they want at that point. <laughs> I'm in trouble, you know? Didn't occur to me then. I just had a stun gun and I'd seen my brother's best friend fall out on the floor. So I knew it could be dangerous. <laughs> That's all I needed. <laughs> because when I'm scared, I arm myself. That's what I do. Because instead of hiding my fear, I wanted to be courageous. I didn't want to be the one that needed someone else. I didn't want to be the one that needed my husband to go save me. I didn't want to be the one that needed my daddy to come check my attic. I didn't want to be the one that wouldn't go anywhere unless I had a group to go with me. I didn't want to be that one. I wanted to be the brave one. I wanted to be the one that didn't need anybody. Because I believed courage is being the only one to know you're afraid. That's what courage was. As long as nobody else knew I was afraid. I was the brave one. Well, <laughs> God knows. And God knows how my mind works. And I go from like, you know, zero to 10 really quick. <laughs> I got a pretty active imagination. And so we bring all that back to, we arm ourselves or we hide. And we do both against God. Um, my cousin years ago had a beautiful baby and she lost her at like six weeks. She, she lost her to SIDS. And the family was tore up about it or whatever. Caleb was, I think maybe a year at that point. He wasn't that old. He was a baby still. And I remember being so afraid that God would take him from me. And so I armed myself against God. When I prayed, we weren't going to talk about my son. He was off limits. When I worshipped, we weren't going to talk about my son. He was off limits. I put a wall between me and God because I knew if he took my kid I would die I would not survive and so there was this push and shove between me and God for a while after she lost um, the baby and I remember being so afraid that I both hid and fought God on the topic and at some point God finally broke through it because only God knows how to be patient with me Finally broke through, and it was very clear, and I was praying one night, and I can't remember what I was praying about, but I just, over and over, I'm not going to pray about that. I've done that twice in my life. Once my dad died, and once when this baby died, I'm not praying about that, Lord. You, I'm not. Nope. Because I have been taught my whole life, if you love something more than God, God will take that thing. God has to be number one in your life. He will demolish anything that doesn't make him number one. And so, I knew at that time in my life that I loved Caleb Abaya way more than I loved God. I knew I did. I didn't want it to be that way, but it was true. That's the way it was. So I was afraid if I bared my heart to God and he saw that, he would take that. I'd just seen him do it. And so I was praying one night about something and then very clearly, and there's been maybe a dozen times in my life where I can tell you it was an audible voice of God. He said, I did not give you that to take it away. And for the first time I grasped that he doesn't take things, he gives things. Amen. 
Because for so long I've been taught God gives and God takes away. No, God just gives. Some things fall away. Some things we choose to leave behind. Some things don't work out. But God didn't give those things if they're not if they're not meant to be with you forever. God didn't give it to you in the first place. Because God's gifts are eternal. And we had prayed for Caleb for three years, and we couldn't get pregnant. We finally got him, and God told me then. I didn't give him to you to take him away. And then when I was scared after the baby, um, the family baby had passed, God said again, I didn't give him to you to take him away. I made you capable of loving him like that. You love him like I love you. I'm not going to take the thing that helps you understand my love for you. How could I ever take what helps you find love for me? And each time I tried to hide from God, again, he was, this is how much I love you. Imagine how much you love that kid. I love you more. When we stop God hiding from God, he gets to reveal some pretty awesome things. Scripture tells us all, all the time not to be afraid and stuff, but we're supposed to hide in God, not from God. Amen. When we're scared of God, we're supposed to turn to God and say, I'm scared of you. I, I'm, I, I know I'm not where I need to be spiritually, and I'm scared what that's going to look like in my life. I know I have failed. I know I have walked away. I know I have challenged. And I don't want to talk to you, and I want to hide from you. But Scripture says we're supposed to hide in him, not from him. Psalm 32, 7 says specifically, you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with joyful shouts of deliverance. Essentially, we say all the time it's God's work when we rest God works. This is a fancy way of saying that. We go hide and do nothing. God protects. We are not supposed to arm ourselves. We're not supposed to set up strategic places where we can fight our way out. We're not supposed to ignore danger or warning signs. We're supposed to run and hide in God and let him protect us. Let that spiritual bubble, that hedge of protection that scripture talks about, come up around us. Because while we stop, God works. And then the most important thing is the last part of this scripture. You surround me with joyful shouts of deliverance. That means while he works, we praise. That means our fear literally turns to praise when we let God be God. When we stop hiding from him and start hiding in him, your fear becomes shouts of deliverance. So what happens when we turn to God? Well, scripture tells us we all know in 1 John, God is love. Simplest sentence in the Bible. God is love. Easy peasy, we all know it. And then it says later that perfect love, God is perfect, casts out fear. Well, Scripture says perfect love casts out fear. God is love. God is perfect, and he surrounds me with shouts of deliverance. So only God can remove our fear. Hiding from him, running from him, ignoring him, putting up walls, challenging that, none of that's going to remove the fear. The truth is I put up all my little baseball bats and golf clubs, and I would go upstairs. I was still afraid. I felt better prepared, but I still was afraid. Otherwise, I'd have gone and put all that stupid stuff up. <laughs> I remember then he came home one night. He didn't notice it the first few days. And then he came home the other, one night, after, like a weekend. And he was like, why are my golf clubs behind the door? And I was like, don't you worry about it. <laughs> you just leave it there. You just leave it there, okay? It's got to Because <laughs> I wasn't going to tell him I was a scare when he wasn't home. <laughs> It didn't make me less afraid to put those out. But you know what would? Hiding in God. It may not remove the monster. It might not remove the danger. Hiding in God might not make the trial or the trouble go away. But it's going to make you less afraid. It's going to cast out your fear. And you know what happens when you're not afraid of something? You don't forget who you are and who he is. You don't forget the power of God. You don't forget to praise in the struggle. You don't forget to put on the armor of God. You don't forget that he's already provided for you. You don't forget that you are loved, that you were saved and sanctified and holy. You don't forget that he's gone to the ends of the earth and then some for you. You don't forget what he did and who you are when you're not afraid. The battle may still be there, but you remember that you're already fighting with victory. You can see clearly when God casts out the fear. Most beautifully, God gives a solution when we're afraid. The first is, when Nathan was working those shifts, I started praying. I don't want him working these shifts. I like it. I'm afraid. <laughs> I don't want to do it. And I'm not going to tell anybody I'm afraid, 
but I'm eight months pregnant and my dad has cancer and I'm spending the day taking him to radiation and I'm trying to potty train a kid who's got a broken arm and a cast that's bent. It's a little much, God. It's a little much. <laughs> and within three months, Nathan was on first shift and never looked back. Because I hid in God. I stopped pretending I wasn't afraid and trying to do it all by myself. In Genesis 3.15, after Adam and Eve had hid and told God what they did, God told them, I will put hostility between you and the woman. He's talking to the snake. Between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This is prophecy 101. God is saying, I'm going to bring Jesus and he's going to take you down. And he's going to do it through her. The first one to sin, the first one to question who she was, the first one to doubt God's divine providence would be the one to take out Satan. She would win in the end. Because it doesn't say Adam's offspring. It doesn't say Adam's seed. It says she will do it. God says, when you hide in me, I will empower you to redeem what you lost. I will make you courageous. I will make you strong enough Tough enough and brave enough. It's going to happen because whatever I want to use you for, I will still use you for it. I will fix it. I had a plan all along. I knew you were going to put all your eggs in that basket. And I had an alternate plan all along. But you were hiding from me and you wouldn't come listen. You wouldn't walk in the breeze of the day because you were embarrassed by what you looked like. You look like my creation, my image. And I am in love with that. <laughs> Sounds a little egotistical, quite frankly. <laughs> God said he made us in his image, and he's in love with us. I'm just like, there's a lot to be said there. <laughs> and so when they come in and they're like, hey, we messed up, and God's like, yeah, you did, and, and there's consequences for that. But the beautiful thing is, there's also healing for that. There's also redemption for that. This doesn't surprise me. I'm not, oh, my God, what did you do? You've thrown everything in chaos. God's not surprised. He didn't need them to tell him what they did. He knew. He knew. He wasn't like, what has happened? Where are they at? He knew. He probably even knew where they were. When he calls out to them, he probably knew which tree they were standing behind. He knew. Just like he knows with us. So when we're scared of things, we have to remember that God is, if we'll hide in him and we'll turn to him, he's going to give us shouts of deliverance. That fear is going to turn into shouts of of deliverance and it's going to happen in his time sometimes you're going you know what i'm ready for some shouting me too <laughs> me too but it comes in his time because there's always a plan to be revealed there's always a lesson to be learned there's always a relationship with him to develop there's always a purpose to the pain there's always a purpose for the journey the problem is we stay in fear so long that we don't get there we forget who we are we forget who he is because we're just afraid of the outcome we have to learn to trust him no matter what and know Scripture says we're going to have shouts of deliverance. He's going to surround us. He's going to protect us. All we have to do is hide in him. Literally hide in him. Let him face the monster. And then we'll come out and put our, our, our foot on his head and be like, we won. <laughs> Every time somebody does something great, like even if it's at church, anytime somebody does something amazing and people are like, you did such a good job with that. Or this soup is so good. Or, or that song was great. I'll go, thank you, even if I didn't do it. I mean, thanks, I work really hard <laughs> and take the credit. Well, God's literally saying you can come take the credit. I'm going to give you shouts of deliverance. I'll do it, but you're going to be the one that gets to shout about it. You're going to be the one that gets to get the glory for it. I'll do it, but I, you've got to hide in me first. Lord, we're thankful that in this spooky season, God, we can turn it around and see that you are great, you are big, you have awesome plans, and all we have to do is hide in you. All we have to do is find you faithful. Lord, the scriptures are full of your love. They're full of an abundant God who gives abundantly. Lord, let us be reminded, Lord, let our fear not block our vision. Let it not block our ability to see us for who we are and see you for who you are so that we can again shout the deliverance that you so easily win day after day. God, we thank, you. we thank you for this message and for your time and for your love at this time, Lord. We bless you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.